Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you're all here today. I know you've all been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks when I announced I was going to do this. I'm here with the historian Nathan Johnston, who wrote an amazing book here, uh, The New Atheum Myth, Myth and History. I absolutely loved it. Uh, this was recommended on the website History for Atheists a while back, and uh, it sounded so good I got the book, and then I enjoyed the book so much I was like, I got to get uh, Nathan on here to uh, uh, talk about the book because it was just like – it was one of those books where it was like every page. I was like, thank you. Somebody <laughs> finally said it. Thank you. It was like every, it, was, it just kept happening. So how are you doing today? Thanks for coming on my channel. Tell us a little about yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, hi, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a historian originally of uh, religious culture. I wrote uh, originally on concepts of the devil and how they change as a consequence of the Reformation. And uh, so I come from that kind of uh, study of witchcraft, study of heresy, that kind of background. Um, and I taught, in, I taught for uh, about well, over 10 years in various universities in uh, England um, and then turned my attention to the new atheism and to what I thought were its problems in terms of its use of history so yeah so again great book now so why did you write this book it's obviously because you're some Christian fundamentalist who just can't stand mm -hmm. atheism and you just obviously yeah. don't believe in any of that stuff right so what yeah <laughs> tell us a little bit about who you are and why you wrote the book well, I wrote it because uh, the new atheists don't speak for me. I, I'm a non-believer. Um, and I was always interested in the God debate. I was always interested in those kind of um, debates over skepticism, belief, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and even before the new atheism emerged. And when it did emerge uh, with uh, you know, Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins writing those, those books and so on, um, and, and so I read them, and, I, and it just occurred to me that increasingly that these were not representative of what I thought and my views, but also specifically being a historian, I was very troubled by the use of history that was being put across there. Um, and I, I originally envisaged writing a kind of just a short book about some of the errors that, that they were that they were putting across. Um, but as as I got more and more into it, the book became longer and longer and more and more detailed, as all of these things always do, and became a much more academic study, not only of the things that, that are not right in their view of history, but also the way in which history is used in their polemic. And mm -hmm. because what the New Atheists do is they, they don't talk in enormous detail about history because they don't have to. They use the authority of history. So because we, we, a lot of us know certain things about history, so we know there was a witch hunt, we know there was an inquisition, we know there were crusades and so on. The new atheists don't really have to um, say an awful lot about that. They just have to use the words. They become kind of trigger words that we all, and they're not so much accusations as they, they tell us to remember convictions, remember what we always knew that religion did, all the bad things that the religion does and so on. And, and the authority of history is appealed to in that way. And the problem with the, with, the, with the new atheism is that much of the things that they were talking about were good decades out of date in terms of where the actual academic history was um, with things to do with you know, the witch hunts, the Inquisition and so on. Their understanding of these things were coming from the vestiges of a, of a 19th century secularist history that wrote in terms of this struggle between secularism and faith and the, the evils of faith. And so they were out of date um, and inaccurate, and but they were using the authority of history, and the the new atheists in sort of create this idea of these these two competing histories: one of the the malevolence of religion, that religion is simply a, a number of episodes of religious um, crime and, and 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 malevolence, and balanced against that is the constant progressive history of skepticism, doubt, and ultimately atheism, that is persecuted throughout history and survives to triumph in the alignment as they as they see it and they see themselves as the heir of that tradition and they see religious people as the heirs of the the tradition of religious malevolence mm -hmm. and these things are very simplistic they are simply no historian no serious historian writes in these terms anymore um, mm -hmm. and so that the outmoded and out of date and then more broadly what really struck me was that this didn't sit with the claims that new atheists made for themselves as evidentialists. They they say, you know, rich people will believe without evidence 
atheists will only believe what they can provide evidence for or logically determine and so on. And if you're going to claim evidentialism as something that gives you a sort of intellectual superiority and as a virtue, then it struck me that you better practice it. And they don't. They, right. you know, they have a very cavalier attitude towards evidence, um, towards evidence that, that suits them and towards evidence that doesn't suit them. So they cherry pick from history those things that seem to make their case about religious malevolence, and they simply ignore outright other things that might lead to more to um, questions about their own position, particularly, uh, you know, atheist persecution in the Soviet Union has got to be the prime example of these sorts yeah. of things. And it's, you know, it, to me, you can't claim ev evidentialism and not practice it. And so in one sense, I thought this, I, ca I came to think of this as a defense of history and a defense of academia, a defense of those processes by which you actually look at evidence and follow evidence where it leads, even if it makes you uncomfortable. So anyway, that was the, the motivation for writing the book. Yeah, it, it was. It, it you, you definitely laid it out very well there. Uh, so for people who, I'm sure most people know who new atheists are, but for mm -hmm. uh, for those people who don't know, people like Richard Dawkins, mm -hmm. Sam Harris, um, mm -hmm. even even you bring up Richard Carrier even in this book, which is mm -hmm. interesting. You yeah. spent a lot of time also responding to Christopher Hitchens and all all mm -hmm. these types of new atheists that really sort of attack religion, demean it, say that mm -hmm. it's more harmful, um, and mm -hmm. use history in a lot of ways to sort of or use, you know, warp, warp history to sort of attack mm. religion. And that tends mm. to be what a lot of new atheists do. So oh. let's get into some of what you talk about in this book. Um, you've, mm. you've touched on a little bit, but I want to get a little bit more into some of the specifics. And I got some questions here. We'll go through as many as we can. Mm. Um, at the end, we'll do some super chats. So if anybody watching wants to put a super chat in, I'll, I'll save it and we'll save it towards the end here. So, but for now, my first question is, um, you open it with an early chapter on the Inquisition and witch burnings. Mm. Mm. This comes up in almost every conversation I get about history of religion. Didn't mm -hmm. religious people, uh, they put out the Inquisition, they burned witches. So it seems a lot of myths about these ideas are, are put out by new atheists. But what are some of the myths about things like witch burnings, the Inquisition, mm -hmm. and then what is the real history? Mm -hmm. Well, the new atheists, I think, for many atheists, uh, witchcraft is important because it shows the sheer danger of supernaturalism. The idea that if you can believe in something without evidence, and this is the assumption that's made, um, then you can believe anything and you can practice anything on that basis. So what, what witchcraft does in terms of atheist history is it allows you to say, here is the sheer sort of deranging influence of supernaturalism on the mind, that you can actually come to believe that these women uh, could, you know, um, cast spells just by asking you how you, how you were or by, uh, by you know... Um, uh, charms or other forms of magic and that um, in believing that you can then come to to torture these people until they confess to things that simply can't happen and then burn them alive and so it forms that kind of uh, that um, uh, it plays that role in new atheist history as being sort of you know the the nadir if you like of just where faith can lead you um, and so in that sense it makes a lot of sense for the for atheists to point to that um, but it's their understanding of it is simply not consistent with what historians over the past 50, 60 years have been um, finding. Um, so, for instance, Sam Harris says in, about witch hunting uh, that, you know, you can't have witch hunting without witch beliefs. So, therefore, the most important point is that people believed in witchcraft and this is what it led them to do. Uh, well, people did. Witchcraft beliefs are absolutely ubiquitous in every society that we know of. Um, you know, the belief that there is a magical world, that it can be accessed by human beings, that human beings will access it and can use it for both good or bad. And those kind of things are, are, are witch beliefs. Every society that we, we know has these forms of witch beliefs. And yet the systematic legal persecution of witches occurs in Europe in the late middle, late medieval to and through the early modern period for about 300 years, and that's it. And even when you look at that, you would have to look at, okay, um, if you look at the number of witch trials that, that there are, um, the number of ex executions and so on, it is not an exaggeration to say that the average inhabitant of early modern Europe never saw a witch trial, never saw. They're just not that, there just aren't enough of them for that to be true. And so this idea that atheists like to, to, to put across that 
Europe sort of, you know, from one end of Europe to the next, you're, you know, burning witches left, right and centre and torturing people and, and so on. It just simply didn't occur. There weren't enough trials for that to be the case. What happens, it happens in very um, uh, localised areas. Uh, most of the trials that we know about take place probably in the, the old Holy Roman Empire. And uh, the very large trials occur in, in a small number of locations over a short period of time. And so if Sam Harris is right, and the sheer belief in the supernatural leads you to persecute people and treat them in this way, the question you would then have to ask is why there's not more witch hunting? Why is there so little witch hunting instead of so much? You would expect formalized legalistic witch hunting to be happening throughout the entire of human history in enormous numbers, if what Sam Harris is saying is true, and it doesn't. What is true is that every single village in early modern England, every village in early modern France or whatever, would have understood the reality of magic in their lives, the reality of witchcraft and so on. And of course, there were informal ways in which you could take redress against witches. You could attack them yourself. You could do counter spells and charms and so on. But legalized, formalized witchcraft is not happening in the scale that, uh, that atheists think it is. Um, and so therefore the question is, why is there not more of it if the power of the supernatural, if the belief in the supernatural has such a deranging influence on the intellect? So that's one myth that, that is, um, uh, is prevalent amongst the this, this sort of atheist understanding of what witchcraft actually is. Um, I suppose the other big one would be the role of the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. Here, this is, this is um, a very notable um, problem because... In, atheist, in, in most new atheist and atheist thinking, Inquisition and witchcraft go together, hand in hand. Um, it was the Inquisition that persecuted witchcraft, only it wasn't. The, this simply isn't true. Um, the Inquisitions, uh, the Portuguese, Roman, uh, Spanish Inquisition and so on, practiced a remarkably skeptical view of witch, witchcraft. Um, and they executed very few witches. Uh, we don't know the exact figures, but we, but, you know, it's estimated that the Spanish Inquisition, for instance, probably executed around two dozen witches before 1610 and didn't execute a single witch after that. Um, and so why is this? Well, it, it's because they they practice a much more skeptical approach to evidence of witchcraft than did secular tribunals, say, in the Holy Roman Empire or in Scotland or in Denmark and, and these kind of places. And they also were much more cautious about evidence um, extracted under torture. Um, and so in centralized legal um, um, systems like the Inquisitions, you tend to get a much more tightly controlled process which is much more skeptical about um, the evidence. So, for instance, uh, inquisitors would... Um, instruct the, pop the local populations that um, crops could be destroyed by natural means, for instance. Um, they would uh, have to gather evidence on both sides for, for the accused and, you know, suspicious artifacts would have to be proved to have no other use than in magic and so on. And most notably is they were very skeptical about evidence taken from the witch's Sabbath, the idea that the witches meet at these Sabbaths. And one of the questions that you ask in witch hunts is, you know, well, did you go to the Sabbath? Yes. Who did you see there? And then you, you that's how that's how witch hunts grow. And the Inquisitions were very skeptical about evidence of attendance at the Sabbath. They would not allow for someone to be to be arrested only, for instance, on somebody naming them as having as having seen them at the Sabbath and so on. And because of these things, um, they execute far fewer witches and. In many cases, in, in inquisitional involvement tends to act as a break on witch hunting, not a not a not a, um, a promoter of it. Most famously in the Basque witch trials of uh, uh, 1609 to 1611, uh, mm -hmm. where the Spanish Inquisition basically brings what would have turned into one of the largest witch hunts to a, to a, to a halt. Um, mm. And so these are the kind of myths that, that are that are circulating that, that historians have, have not really taken seriously for for years. Another example would be the sheer number of people executed for witchcraft. Um, you know, sometime in the in the 18th century, uh, a figure of nine million uh, women executed for witchcraft uh, emerged and was sort of taken up and so on. And the figures we have now are around about maybe 30, 35,000. Mm. And so this kind of genocidal assault didn't occur. Um, and 
historians have known about all these things for, for decades, literally decades. And yet the new atheism was still putting out these ideas that there were millions of people being killed as witches by the Inquisition. Mm. Things that are simply not true. Mm. And I, I just want to be clear for the audience. We're not saying like it was okay for them to even to you know execute even the, the couple, the yeah. very few that they did. I mean, no. we're putting it in context. No. The new no. atheists make these claims that it was just like thousands of people left and right. And it's it's much more in context. It was much more controlled, a lot more skepticism was involved. Well, and Sam that, Harris has, has, has said that uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, it doesn't it doesn't change the the, the plight of the individual witch. And it's absolutely true. And but no historian mm -hmm. has argued that, no historian thinks that. Um, but the problem of numbers is a problem of the of of the of atheists' um, own making. If you if you start to, if you talk about something in terms of genocide, and it turns out not to be on that scale, then that's a problem for your argument. You've created that problem yourself. You see I me. Mean? That doesn't mean that witch hunting was acceptable. It doesn't in any way lessen the plight of each individual witch, who after all were tortured and killed by people who didn't have to believe they were guilty. Um, mm -hmm. Witchcraft, in that sense, will always be a tragedy. Um, it's just not what the new atheists are saying it is. Right. And that, that brings me to my next question, because I there's a really good quote in your book, because everyone says, well, you know, there, even if it wasn't a lot, this is still what, you know, religion causes. Religion leads to this kind of stuff. And you, you directly mm -hmm. hammer this in your book on page 224. Again, mm -hmm. uh, you say this. Between the end of the Roman Empire and the late 12th century, torture had fallen into disuse in Europe. Christendom owed its reintroduction not to bloodthirsty clerics, but to scientific jurists concerned to free justice from the reliance on God's intervention and to champion human judicial competence. In both medieval Europe and modern-day America, then, societies that had abandoned torture contemplated its reintroduction as a rational necessity. But the medieval story, the one for which we know the ending, recounts the failure of rationalism to control its offspring. So can you elaborate a little bit more on this? Mm. Because new atheists will say, you know, the the, mid, the torture that happened in the Middle Ages, Middle Ages, this is what happens when Christians get in power or anyone mm. who's religious gets in power. Mm. But what's the real history that you're talking about here in this chapter? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, Sam Harris, um, in you know, in the End of Faith, um, describes torture exactly in that way as a as, as you know, delusional clerics forcing their fantasies on the on, on the innocent, and then a hundred pages later tells us that we have to torture Muslim terror suspects. And, yeah, I remember that. But, um, you know, that double standard that, that he expresses is justified by the notion that somehow modern, you know, one presumes he, he means atheist or, or at least skeptical secular people can somehow be trusted with torture in a way that religious people can't. That, that we could somehow use our rationality as an ethical sort of gun site so we would know the appropriate ways in which to, to use torture. Um, when necessary, um, so it's a it's a it's a, a remarkable claim for a kind of intellectual and moral superiority. Um, so then the, the question is, well, what actually happened? What you know, what you know, is this is this true? And and certainly, yes, torture was very very widely used and abused um, in in medieval Europe. That's not not for question. No one should think that torture was ever a good thing or that torture was ever a reasonable thing to do. Um, but the development of torture in medieval Europe has a different story. So um, before around by the 12th century, when you have legal codes and, and, and practices that are based around local communities and based around what's known as the accusatory system of justice, where somebody has to go and, and, and prosecute a crime themselves as the victim, if you see what I mean, those tend to be based on things like the oath and the ordeal, the idea of swearing an oath of a, a person of good standing, swearing an oath of their innocence, or having to perform the ordeal. And the, in both cases, these things are taken as um, as being um, overseen by God. Um, and so, of course, the ordeal is that if you survive the ordeal, you know, relatively unscathed, God has shown that you are innocent, and so on. In the 12th century, with increasing centralization of government and church structures in the 12th century, there is a, a recovery of a sort of, of, of um, a Roman law and a desire to rationalize legal process, to take away what is what is seen by, by jurists at the time as being superstitious. You know, um, the ordeal um, uh, is seen as, as, as a superstitious practice which should be removed and replaced with the ability of human beings to determine guilt and innocence and to investigate crime and so on. And in order to do that, what they, what they do is they look at the Roman law of treason and they take the, um, 
the proof system of that, which is that you can only have a conviction if you have two eyewitnesses or a confession. And this, that standard of proof is so high that it means you have human competence uh, to, to prosecute crime equal to God's omnipotence, if you see what I mean. It's a way of replacing one with the other. But what it means is that what do you do if you don't have two eyewitnesses and someone refuses to confess? Can you leave them to just choose not to confess? And so historians of torture have argued that almost um, certainly um, torture had to sort of come along because otherwise the, that legal system couldn't have had any credibility, you know? And so very, very quickly, the idea of torturing someone until they confess um, is, is sort of locked in with that attempt to make jurisprudence rational, to make it something that can be, that can follow a set process and be rational. Um, it's, it's, it's just part of it. Um, but what then happens is that there are very, very strict rules supposedly in theory as to how that how that's done you can't just decide to torture somebody uh, evidence has to be provided of their of their guilt and make it likely that this person will confess under torture um you know the decision to torture can itself be be appealed um if they are tortured there are very strict rules as to under what conditions they can be tortured how long um what sort of questions can be asked you're not allowed to ask leading questions you're not allowed to use what they term sort of novelty in torturing methods they have to be very certain methods and so on and so on now all of this was immediately open to abuse no one should doubt that this was ever you know or, or that anybody should ever <laughs> advocate this but it was a rationalized system and it mm. was and it was based in the notion of attempting to create a rational system of jurisprudence that would in, that would enable human beings to be responsible for seeking out crime, not God. Um, where it goes most severely wrong is in the emergence of things like heresy and witchcraft, because what develops is a notion of what's what's known as a crimeum exceptum, an exceptional crime, crimes that are so heinous and so so dangerous that the normal forms of jurisprudence can't be allowed to get in the way of prosecuting. Um, and so particularly in witchcraft. So when witchcraft moves from being a crime of an individual crime committed by an individual witch, so maleficium itself, you know, like the, the harm by magic, is in fact a kind of form of assault. Um, where it becomes um, um, problematic is when it becomes associated with diabolic allegiance, the idea that the, the witch has to have joined a diabolic cult in order to have these powers. Because then witchcraft becomes indicative of a more fundamental assault on society by a diabolic anti-society. And that's much more of a crisis than an individual person having their crops ruined or, or so on. And it's in that atmosphere of crisis and the atmosphere of um, a sort of assault on Christian society that the rules on torture and evidence and so on are, are taken as niceties that can be done away with because uh, the crisis is too great. Um, and so it's this idea of these anti-societies and these ideas of these crimes that are so heinous that you don't you don't stick to the rules are what leads to the widespread abuse of torture. You know, um, it's simply forcing people to, to say what you wanted to say, which is you know, mm -hmm. the kind of picture that Sam Harris gives us um, it does become um, an aspect of the witch trials in some places. You know, it does become an aspect of the witch trials. But it does so because what was originally intended as a rational system has become prone to those kind of fears, to moral panic, basically. And so what's interesting about Sam Harris is that um, whilst advocating the torture of Muslim terror suspects, he has a justification for its use that is so nebulous and lax that it's, You'd, have, you'd, you'd really have to ask what disqualifies a Muslim from being tortured in Sam Harris's perspective. Um, and he's created his own anti-society. And this is what's problematic about this, is that he argues, of course, that Islam is an anti-society. It's a death cult. It is based on this, this idea of, of world conquest. And, you know, he says, you know, uh, he, um, um, honesty is the, is the Muslim world's scarcest resource. He's, he's said that and so on. Um, he's created his own moral panic, and this is precisely where those kind of rational uses of torture dissolve. So there's there's a there's an irony in that in in in, in condemning religious 
uses of, of torture as delusional and so on, uh, and then advocating the torture of Muslim ter terror suspects, but then characterizing Islam as an anti as a, as an anti society and a death cult, he's kind of traveling the same path himself, um, and he's not aware of it or appears not to be aware of it, um, presumably because obviously the history isn't isn't there. Right, and I like the way you put that. That was a good way of drawing that comparison. Like like, and you you cover that in the book. It's it's like he's sort of doing what a lot of the people who did torture in the middle ages do it's the same kind of logic like it's us versus them kind of mentality you need to go get them well I, yeah i mean i do i do have to say that you know um there is this assumption about sam harris that he's kind of an enthusiast for violence and and these things mm. and um i don't think that i have to say no that's that's not what i'm arguing i don't think mm -hmm. i think sam harris has no illusions as to how terrible torture is but his trust in the idea that it might be um, a terrible thing we might have to accept. His trust in his rationality, his trust in the rationality of people like him to determine that, I think is problematic given that he then indulges in moral panic, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So just to clarify yeah. that. I'm not yeah. saying that, that that he's enthusiastic about torturing people. Um, I think I think that's a, that there's a common misunderstanding of Sam. Yeah, position. and I think that was, it's good you clarified that. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it just seems like a lot of, atheists just equate something bad happening in christendom with mm -hmm. a reflection of religion or christianity itself but they won't mm -hmm. do this for like atheistic nations like the ussr mm -hmm. and you talk a lot about ussr in this book about mm -hmm. atheist regimes and you draw some good comparisons so like you talk about mm -hmm. christopher hitchens mm -hmm. and his book god is not great um mm -hmm. and he just seems to say anything bad that happened in history was a result mm -hmm. of religion and anything yeah. good happened in history was a result of secularism so Martin Luther King's junior work, well, that was secularism at work. Mm -hmm. But Stalin, who yeah. is an atheist, that's mm -hmm. religious-like motivations. So yes. Martin Luther King, who's a Christian, is mm -hmm. it's secularism causing him to do good things. How mm -hmm. is this an abuse of history when they sort of just do this blame game? Anything bad happens is a result of religion. Anything yeah. good that happens, that's a rejection of religion. What's going mm -hmm. on when Hitchens does something like this? And what's the real history going on? Um, yeah, I, I, I think... He... It, it comes down to these these parallel histories that that the new atheists and and Hitchens they they see uh, history as a series of episodes um, of religious malevolence, um, and that's a self explain explaining um, position. Uh, so that um, if you want to know why something something you know terrible happened in the Inquisition or the Crusades or whatever, well, it's religion, of course it is. I mean that's that, you know. You know, um, if you want to know why this age was by, well, was barbaric, well, it was because it was a religious age. These things become self-explanatory. They don't need to, you know, I mean, they were, you know, they don't attempt to get into the context of how these things happened. Um, and on the other side, they have their own narrative where they they kind of flatter themselves and everybody else like them with the idea that they're, they're, they're this, this illustrious company of these skeptics and people who stood out against against these things. And you get these two competing sides of history. Um and the problem with this is it's, it, it works through decontextualizing. So it, you have to take away all of the social and political influences to say that simply belief motivated action. You know, that, that um, uh, so when in fact what historians look at is the way in which beliefs and cultures interact with, pol with politics um, to produce, you know, uh, the things that they're looking at would be the Inquisition or, 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 or whatever. And so it's an abusive history in the sense that it creates a single narrative history in which things are simply episodes that have already been that have already been pre-concluded to be episodes of religious malevolence. Um, and it creates an idea that somehow or other religion is all powerful and all dissolving when it's let loose, uh, in a sense that so um you know why do christians persecute people because deuteronomy says that they should for instance you know and belief explains explains, explains action there and the new atheists are quite open in many cases about um um refusing to indulge in what they call relativism in in, in this idea that that um that things are explained in in in, in context um, that's to be that's to be relativist. That's to, to rather than, than an absolute understanding that faith and belief itself motivates action. Um, 
And so there are literally different types of people in history to the new atheists. There are believers who are constantly pushed by their religion into these uh, into these um, evil acts, if you want to call them that. And then there is the constant virtue of the skeptics, of those of those who doubt and so on. Um, and they need to avoid contextualization in order to, in order to pursue this line, because contextualization will always tell you that, in fact, it's ex so. If 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 um, so, say take take scriptural um, uh, justifications for witch hunting, for instance. For the new atheists, those scriptural, you know, thou shall not suffer a witch. You know, those are what mo read it and do it. Um, what historians would argue is that the decision to hunt for witches and so on these these complex things are already there and. The, the scriptural justification is part of that, but it isn't the motivating factor, the one thing that starts it off, if you see me. Um, so in that way, yes, it's a, it's a complete decontextualization of history. Mm -hmm. And so talking a little bit about like atheist regimes, if they're going to contextualize history, they got to do it on mm -hmm. the other side as well, but they don't. On page 181 of your book, you have this, the oppression of believers by atheists and in the name of atheism itself is simply an historical fact. Mm -hmm. Now remember, you're an, I want everyone to remember you're a non-believer. I'm not talking here to, with a Christian fundamentalist. I'm talking with an academic historian mm -hmm. uh, who's taught at university for years and uh, who is also a non-believer. Mm -hmm. So, what do you mean by this? What do you are you saying? Atheism leads to oppression. Elaborate a little bit more on this and talk about how mm -hmm. uh, how new atheists sort of just ignore this. Yeah. Well, yes. To be clear, I, I'm not arguing that atheism leads to oppression. Um, I wanted to make sure people were aware of that. Yeah, that's 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 not my argument. Um, what I am arguing is that um, atheism can and it has. So um, one of the, th the there is an assumption amongst the new atheists and, and, and atheists more broadly that for some reason, atheism can't ever lead to bigotry and oppression and so on. Uh, and this is justified mainly on two bases. The first is that atheism isn't a belief system. So why would you kill somebody on the basis of what you don't believe? You know, um, oppression uh, is comes from ideology, and atheism is an ideology. Atheism is simply a lack of belief in the spiritual world. So because atheists tend to base their beliefs in rationality and reason, rationality and reason are the sort of things that protect you from becoming a bigot and from, from ideology and, and, and so on. That somehow uh, the mindset that leads you to be an atheist is also the mindset that will protect you from becoming uh, um, a, a persecutor of, uh, of other people. Um, and when both of these, I think, are problematic. Um, so take the first one. Yes, to say that atheism is is to simply not believe in something. Yes, that's true. That, yeah, and and in that sense, there isn't anything worth persecuting somebody for. But I, it's disingenuous, I think, for atheists to think that that's where it stops because it doesn't. If you conclude that there is no spiritual world, then there are a whole series of questions that follow from that. Which is, if if there is no God, why have so many people believed in God? If there is no God, is that a good thing? You know, what about all of the human resources, intellectual and physical, that have been that have been put into um, the belief in God? Has that been a waste of time? What about the conflicts around beliefs in God and different beliefs in God, um, and so on and so on? These this kind of cascade of questions follows from the conclusion of atheism, which, and and I don't know of any atheist, personally or or in print, who doesn't have a view on is religion a good thing? Is it a bad thing? On balance, you know, and and so on. Um, now, there's nothing in that that says that you will then come to want to eradicate religion in a violent way. Um, you know, there are atheists like me who have no problem with the existence of religion. But there is a logic for the development of a, a viewpoint in which religion is seen as fundamentally bad, as fundamentally damaging. And you can follow that logic further on to get to the point where you think religion is so dangerous that it has to be got rid of. Um, and these are the most extreme, these are the most militant atheists, if you me, of, of those who believe that it's imperative that religion be got rid of for human flourishing, that humans cannot flourish in a world where there is religion. Now, that's an ideology. I don't see how that's not an ideology. Um, and as an ideology, it's something that you can decide to pursue um, in an aggressive fashion. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that even most, athe most atheists will think this. But there is a logic there, and there is a road to be to be travelled there, 
and the new atheists have gone further along that road than than most atheists probably i think they are um they are relatively out there in some of their views because if you actually read what most they what the most of the new atheists say is they would like to see religion gone Mm -hmm. um you know their ideal is that religion will waste away you know um but what if it doesn't waste away you know um and the idea again that reason and, and rationality will protect you from becoming um uh you know uh, oppressive um is some it's it's not really explained as to why that should be <laughs> um it, it's 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 for, for some reason that's never quite explained if an atheist Stalin, for instance, starts to behave in um, an oppressive fashion, somehow or other they have lost their atheism and they become somebody else's problem. So again, your example, you know, Stalin is acting like a religious person, so therefore it's your problem. Um, mm. And yet it's never really explained as to what that process is and where, where that point is at which somebody becomes like a religious person. Have you seen them? That's never really explained. And it's just used as a kind of general get out clause, but it's never really explained. And the truth of the matter is that in the Soviet Union, this was exactly played out. You know, the Soviets were uncompromising, absolutely uncompromising in their ideal of a modern materialist state. They viewed that as absolutely fundamental to the emergence of communism and the emergence of a of a, of a utopian communist state. It would be atheist. There was simply no question about that. And there were various different types of... Um, uh, approach to how that would be achieved. Some believed it would simply wither away. So, for instance, if you show people the benefits of materialism, you show them science, you show them technology, you show them, they will they will understand. Or if you take away, so if you you know if you reveal religious frauds like you know icons that that weep and things like that, um, you know that will convince people and so on. Religion will simply fade away. But what they found was it didn't happen, and um, and the response to the tenacity of religion was always repressive. And then they would go through these various sort of drives in various different periods where it became you know, more uh, um, to the forefront of, of, of Soviet policy. And they were always repressive. Um, and the, the Soviets never gave up on the ideal that they would ultimately create a world, a, a, a society without religion in it. Um, mm. And so there were those who were sent to the gulag, there were those who were killed, priests and so on. And the the assumption again is that somehow or other that wasn't an assault on religion. So Christopher Hitchens, for instance, says it was only anti-clericalism. What they were doing was getting rid of the Tsarist church because the Tsarist church was a bastion of, because the, the Orthodox church was a bastion of Tsarism. Now it takes a peculiar understanding to, to think that the removal of a church from a community isn't an assault on the religion of its parishioners. I mean, I don't you know. That's a that's a very strange way of thinking about it. Um, the the Bolsheviks knew that they were assaulting the religion of the parishioners when they when they killed priests and when they you know uh, demolished churches and so on. But more broadly, there was the constant experience of the everyday life of religious people in Russia, which was to know that they were not welcome mm. through propaganda, through the abolition of religious holidays, um, and and these kind of cultural assaults the soviets made it absolutely clear to religious people that they that they were not welcome they may be being tolerated to a greater or lesser extent depending on what period you're in but they certainly weren't welcome they certainly had no place in the in the communist utopia and they were you know th there was no doubt about that um and so religious people in russia were forced to negotiate that system so um, setting up secret churches, for instance, or removing worship to into inside the home, or even inside their own heads. You know, the one thing that they could not regulate in any way was prayer. You know, uh, this has been described by one historian as internal emigration, a way in which rich people sort of moved further and further into a different reality uh, within the Soviet state. And there is books and books on this. Um, uh, the idea that that atheists can say this didn't happen, um, it's it's to me very curious because if you're an atheist and you ignore the one time when there was a serious attempt to create an atheist state, then you're then you're ignoring the one time when when what you believe in was attempted, um, and therefore you're not going to learn the lessons for it. 
Um, and it's 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 interesting to, to me that there are books on atheism, not written by new atheists, for instance, um, you know, uh, that do not mention Soviet atheism. But among Soviet historians, there's no question about this. You know, this is all very, very mainstream Soviet history. Um, and yes, so if you if you don't recognize where your own beliefs can lead, you you're not guarding yourself against being led down that path. I think I think it's I think it's incumbent on on atheists to accept that this is true, and that doesn't mean that that the worst of the uh, of the the accusations that are leveled by theists and atheists that this is an automatic process. I don't think that's true, but we ought to accept it. We ought to acknowledge it and accept it. Um, I, you know, and if we are if we are to to tell religious people that they have to accept the bad sides of their own history, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, wars of religion, and so on, then we cannot do that and not accept the bad sides of our own. Right, and I, I like the way you you said that. It's like it's not going to automatically lead to it, but it, it can, no. and that can happen with with any belief system, Islam, Christianity, atheism, it's, we need to all accept that can happen, but it doesn't mean it yeah. necessarily leads to it. And you, in the last chapter of your book, you go into that in a lot more detail. So I just want people to be aware. Um, mm -hmm. I have linked his book below for the, if you want to get a Google play version or a Kindle, or if you want to even get a hard copy below. Uh, but I, I know the Google play and the Kindle versions are a, a lot cheaper right now. So mm -hmm. final question, and then mm -hmm. we're going to go to the super chats that we got a couple so far. So if anyone has super chats, I have been uh, saving them in a, a separate uh, uh, part of uh, StreamYard. So we'll get to them in a minute here. But I want to talk briefly about everyone's least favorite group, the Nazis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a great chapter on, in this book on the Nazis. And it seems if it's fundamentalist Christians, I mean, you even mentioned how fundamentalist Christians have abused not Nazi mm -hmm. history, but also new atheists. They always mm -hmm. are trying hard. Everyone is always trying hard to mm -hmm. claim the Nazis for the other group. Well, they're just mm -hmm. like you. Mm -hmm. um, and Everyone seems to be oversimplifying. And so you talk about Nazism possibly being what we could call a political religion. Mm -hmm. So talk, talk a little bit about what their main motivators were. What do historians think the, the Nazis mm -hmm. believe that led to these horrible atrocities they committed? Yeah. Well, I put it in context. Both sides of the God debate um, have this use of history as a use of hitler as a kind of acid test um if you can if you can find that your enemy that, that hitler was one of one of your enemies then that tells you everything you need to know about them. um and what's strange is that despite the fact that hitler probably has the claim to being the most studied individual in history we still don't know basically but i mean that's addressed in the book i won't go into that now um but it's a very simplistic thing, um, um, approach to take. Um, so in the book, what I was looking at was there is a whole history of, of the relig religiosity in Nazi Germany that is simply ignored by the new atheism. Um, it, whilst they're looking for quotes from Hitler, which you know would back up their argument, they're ignoring the entire history of religiosity um, in Nazi Germany. And, and so one aspect of, Nazi, of, of that history would relate to the God debate and what would it mean if you were to 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 use them so again I'm not saying that the political religion theory because it is controversial is the history of Nazi, Nazi Germany mm -hmm. um, I mean but what would it mean if as a new atheist you were to use this because it would seem to give plenty of ammunition to the, to the new atheists only not quite it wouldn't quite um, help them in the way that, that they might like um, so political origin is the idea um, that uh, Nazism was a, a new form of religion uh, that came out of secularization. And that um, what political origin theory does is, whereas other historians of Nazi Germany have tended to see its religious ceremony, the rituals, the Nuremberg rallies, all these kind of things, as basically a kind of cynical fraud, a pretense of, religi of religiosity. Um, Political religion theory takes it seriously as something that could be believed in as a religion. So um, Nazi emphasis on race, on nation, on the Fuhrer, the idea of um, uh, common religious tropes like creation and a lapsarian myth about the, the idea of the Aryan race 
um, that has fallen from grace and then needs to reestablish itself through its victory over its Malachian rivals, which is the Jewish race and so on. The idea of deliverance through the savior prophet, which is the Fuhrer um, and redemption through um, immersion into the, uh, the race and nationhood. These for political origin are things theories theorists are things that can be taken seriously as things that could be believed in rather than simply cynical demagoguery um and so um they argue that that religion sorry that the nazism offered a politics as a religion politics as a religious experience a religious an experience of, of, of sort of mysticism and and um and so on and so in that sense you you've got um the evidence on the side of the of the new atheists if you see what i mean that, that nazism can be seen as a religion um mm -hmm. uh however what political religion theory argues about where that comes from wouldn't sit comfortably with the new atheist perspective because the new atheists want to see nazism as a continuance of traditional religion as simply a sort of alien pollutant into the modern rational world because nazism is taken to be irrational to be um cultic therefore it can't have anything to do with modernity secularization and so on and political religion theory argues something different it argues that nazism was one of a num of any number of new religions that came out of the process of secularization once the the religious impulse was taken away from traditional churches um it sort of runs free to find different focuses for itself um there is political religion argues a sort of need amongst human beings to find a sort of um transcendent higher truth to submit their lives to um and if you take away traditional religion then basically anything can, can serve that purpose in this world. So the state, uh, uh, modernity, modernity itself, communism, uh, the race, the nation, all of these things can become a form of higher reality that the traditional religious um, instinct can be focused on. Um, and that the irony is that, that secularization um, allowed for things that would not previously have been um uh seen in that way to be seen in that way um so if you take the example of the state for instance traditionally the state has sacral authority because of the anointing of a king by the church uh after the enlightenment the state itself can become the object of deification and and devotion um in this world and, and these 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 high, these forms of higher meaning can be found in what's termed this worldly religions and so whilst the new atheists could use political religion um to argue that nazism is a form of religion if they did so they would have to accept that nazism came out of secularization came out of a very peculiar rela relationship between secularization and sacralization and the, the, you know the um um and then they would have to accept something closer to what someone like Karen Armstrong talks about as homo religiosus, the idea of, an, of a religious instinct within people, that if it's, not, if it's not focused on traditional religion, can then become focused on this worldly religions, whatever they might be. Um, and then, you know, their, their ideals about further secularization, about the, the sort of withering of religion, um, seem less and less likely to be true and more and more likely that that if you take away religion or, or um, your religion traditional terms you're more likely to have it re-emerge in unexpected ways within secular society um, and so what I was trying to do in that chapter is really show what the sort of things that, that historians talk about are what the sort of things they're discussing and what it would mean for that to be incorporated into the god debate it's very very far from the was hitler a christian end of things it mm -hmm. requires it's a much more sophisticated um, argument and one which you know um should calm the ardor of both sides if you see what i mean because it turns out to be vastly more complicated and complex than they would like to believe yeah, I, I like the way you put that. That does, and there there is other research coming out, like uh, Roger Brubaker, for example, is mm. writing on how 
uh, what's happening in Europe sometimes is a lot of as as like uh, religious belief is declining. It's not going away, especially for people on the right. It's just being reinterpreted mm-hmm. in terms of mm-hmm. civilization or nationalistic terms. Yeah. Uh, so it's very interesting to see that when you sort of dissolve religion in society, especially for some groups, it doesn't go away. It just gets reinterpreted in these secular ways. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that what you were talking about in the chapter actually aligns mm-hmm. with a lot of research that has come out showing this, this, this idea that there's interesting studies that have done that shown that like Christian nationalism mm-hmm. shows about people that are like the least churched or they're mm-hmm. like the least religious. So yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah. 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 So uh, let's let's move on to some super chats again. Uh, we're uh, these are just some brief notes mm-hmm. on the book. We didn't talk about everything. Mm-hmm. Really, really good book. Uh, covers a lot of this and more in a lot of details. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, if you want to deal with arguments from new atheists, this is like a standard book in my view that you have to pick up and read. It will <laughs> give you what you it because not only do you just like address some of the arguments, you show uh, double standards. You show issues in their own reasoning, which needs to be, which needs to be, have a, a light shown on it. And so you did a really good job uh, uncovering that in the book. And I really appreciate that. So uh, first chat, um, let's just pull this up here. Um, no, uh, this is uh, of course the verse about greeting everyone with a holy kiss. If you're, you're going to have to buy me a drink first, if you want to do that, buddy. Uh, but let's get to our first question here. Um, so this is from Tam Chris. Uh, any comment on the Goa Inquisition that St. Xavier commanded Inquisition on pagans, uh, i.e. Hindus? I'm not sure if you know anything about that. If not, don't worry too much about it. Uh, I really don't. And I, I no, I, I couldn't, couldn't comment, I'm afraid. Sorry, I, I, I don't. Yeah, totally understandable. Sometimes people ask questions and it's like, mm-hmm. oh, it's not what you're an expert on or anything. Uh, appreciate the super chat. Thank you for that. Uh, here's a question from uh, Carmel Krunk. Uh, why are there so many depictions of Jews being tortured during the Spanish Inquisition? Uh, well, again, this this isn't an area of, of of my expertise, but the treatment of Jews by the Spanish Inquisition is very different from the treatment of witches. Um, and yes, they, they, that is much closer to the traditional um, uh, picture of the Inquisition as a persecuting tool. There was much less restraint. Um, and... It's a it's a very very different picture. So yes, Jews were tortured and 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 persecuted by the Inquisitions. Um, um, yes, that's that's just a fact. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. And again, we're not excusing any of that when we talk about the no, Inquisition. No, no. What you, you know, what we, you've done, you put a lot more context and just sort yeah. of dealt with a lot of the propaganda around it. Yeah, I, I'm not in any way trying to argue that the Inquisitions were. Um, uh, benign organizations they were forms of well they have been described and it's not i suppose it's fair enough as forms of religious totalitarianism if you uh you know um so if you if you take let, let if, you, if you take sort of heresy what heresy is is heresy isn't to disbelieve what the church says that's error heresy is to maintain that disbelief when someone in authority usually a bishop has told you that you're wrong that's when you become a heretic um and so, however restrained the Inquisitions might have been, uh, and sometimes, you know, they weren't, um, the choice on offer was was still the same: affirm the Catholic faith or faith or die. I mean, that that that's it. And so, I'm not trying to in any way argue that that isn't that that isn't the truth about mm-hmm. this. Um, the process, and then there is a chapter in the book about this. The process by which you get to that point is much more complex than what the new atheists would have you to believe. That simply religious religion motivates you to want to kill people who disagree with you um uh, it's much much more complicated mm-hmm. uh, thank you for the uh, super chat darren no question with that appreciate it i uh, just want to let you know that uh you're not alone in this uh agnostics says he's enjoying the conversation appreciates that uh here's another non-believer just saying really enjoy uh, just enjoying when this type of criticisms are happening here so um so yeah with that I think we've gone through all the super chats. I appreciate everybody who uh, put one in. Again, if you want to check out the book, I highly recommend you read it, dealing with arguments you're going to get from like Hitchens, uh, Dawkins. Um, you even cover some arguments from Carrier and Hector Avalos. Is that how you pronounce his last name? Yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, really good book. I really appreciate you coming on the channel to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
What's hold on? We just had one more super chat coming here, so let's see what this is. Thoughts on the Catholic King Leopold did in Congo in the 1800s? I'm not sure if that's inside of your wheel. Again, um, I, I I wouldn't want to. Uh, um, it's not my area. I wouldn't want to. Yeah. 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 Don't don't ever feel. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's just yeah. It's it's uh, you know. Um, I, I I would be extremely in, missing ill informed if I tried to to, to make any call. Yeah, I pr cowboy one thousand. I appreciate the super chat. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it's outside of his area of expertise. We don't you know uh, make them answer it or anything like that. So again, thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, check out the book, The New Atheism Myth and History. Uh, thanks for coming on my channel today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.